Now, on an occasion like this, bringing together people from all over the world for collective celebration and advancement of our field, I think it is also important to recognize the conflicts that exist within the field. And I would like to begin my remarks today by referring to one particular conflict. This revolves around the question of how we position history of science in relation to science itself. This issue has created some deep divisions, which I think should be recognized, discussed, and healed. In history of technology and medicine too, I believe that similar divisions can be detected, though I will only be speaking about science today, as that's what I know best. So I would invite parallel or contrary reflections from historians of medicine and technology. The title of my lecture is a deliberately provocative and controversial one, and I hope you'll forgive me for that. I think on an occasion like this, it's actually not such a bad thing to have a little bit of controversy. At least it will give you something to talk to each other about, if everything else you hear this week is too sensible and boring. <laughs> My title refers to some people's sentiment that in much current work in history of science, there's a trend to avoid engaging with the technical content of scientific knowledge, a trend that would be detrimental to the health of our discipline if it became truly dominant. Back in 1980, Science Magazine attributed the following remark to Charles Gillespie under the title, History of Science, Losing Its Science. Gillespie was reported to have said, once a highly respected field, once, that focused on the conceptual evolution of scientific ideas, the history of science is losing its grip on science, leaning heavily on social history, and dabbling with shoddy scholarship. Now, that was an extreme expression, of course, but similar feelings have been expressed by many others. Here's Olivier Daigor, one of the scholars I most respect in our business. He says, uh, he laments that most historians ignore the few histories that still make attempts at engaging the more abstruse, codified parts of scientific work and underestimate them as fossils of an outdated historical, historiographical tradition. So, the disgruntled internalist, as I shall call them for a moment, they say, if all we want to study is the history of scientists, not science, and their institutions and their social and cultural determinants and influences, if we want to insist that science is just another social cultural phenomenon, if we're not going to deal with the distinctive practices of science producing knowledge, then there's no clear reason, they say, why we should have a separate field of history of science with our own independent departments, societies, or journals. In that case, we should just join the ranks of general historians and declare history of science obsolete. Now, it's certainly nice when other kinds of historians recognize science as an important part of society, and also when history, history departments give us jobs. <laughs> but, content-free analysis of science cannot constitute the entirety or even the core of a discipline properly called history of science. That's one side. On the other side, of course, there are a number of people who say that joining general history departments is precisely what we should be doing. And many of you have done so. They feel that uh, historians of science should be first and foremost properly trained historians with methods and sensibilities shared with other historians. Catherine Olesko, editor of Osiris for the last decade, declared that the 11 volumes that she edited were, quote, designed to dissolve boundaries between history and the history of science, unquote. On this side, People often worry that focusing on the content of science without attention to its social and cultural context prevents a well-rounded understanding of the development and significance of science. 
some of the more impatient contextualists have been frustrated that we still cannot seem to get rid of the dinosaurs who don't have a real sense of history and who just want to talk about science. Looking more positively towards the future, Olesko and Robert Korra surveyed the cutting edge of Anglophone scholarship in the history of science last year and detected the following popular themes. Communication and circulation, place and space, publishing and print culture, and lay meanings and uses of science, among others. They consider these themes to be the concepts with the promise to take our field beyond an aimless profusion of microstudies in the aftermath of the demise of grand narratives. Now, it would certainly be possible to use these themes to frame content-focused research, but in actuality this doesn't happen very much. Scientific content is just not a preoccupation in this line of work. By now, the young Turks have become establishment figures, and social and cultural history of science is the order of the day, at least in some countries. But the old argument is not over, and the conflict is still real, even though the picture I've just given you is, of course, a crude caricature. As late as 2007, Kostas Gavroglu and Jürgen Renn still reckoned that the tension between the focus on content and on context was responsible for much of the acrimony presently prevailing in our fields. The causes and consequences of this tension need to be addressed urgently and at, and at a deep level. Of course, many people have tried to bring the different perspectives together, and I only intend to continue and build on their efforts. Many, many examples, but for one, Anna Maria Goldfarb and her colleagues have called for an articulation of a distinct identity of the historian of science as a scholar committed to bringing three spheres of analysis together, which she calls internal, contextual, and historiographical. I don't know how much this call from San Paolo and other comparable ones have been heard around the world. <coughs> Before giving my own positive view on this issue, I would like to clear away some widespread misconceptions, which can be expressed as a set of false dichotomies. First of all, there's a persistent notion that social history and intellectual history are mutually exclusive opposites. Against that idea, we need to remember those classic works which demonstrated brilliantly that social and intellectual analyses of science can be coextensive, including the works of Peter Garrison or Andrew Pickering on modern physics, the sociological reductionism of the strong program in the sociology of scientific knowledge, and Stephen Shapin and Simon Schaffer on early modern epistemic and social <coughs> order. <coughs> cultural history is also often held up as the opposite of intellectual history, and this is very puzzling to me. I mean, only people from very anti-intellectual cultures could imagine cultural as the opposite of intellectual. As Robert Thornton put it in The Great Cat Massacre, the meaning of cultural history is that it treats our own civilization in the same way that anthropologists study alien cultures, capturing the otherness of the past to understand it in its own terms, to unravel an alien system of meaning. But this is precisely what intellectual historians of science have been doing to science for many, many decades. The alleged contrast between cultural and intellectual only comes because one perversely excludes science from culture and then looks for its so-called cultural context. Similarly, there's a widespread view that if we concern ourselves with the rationality of science, then we cannot do social or cultural history, or vice versa. For this misconception, Philosophers of science and the internal historians of science are just as responsible as those allegedly on the other side. 
we need to get beyond this misconception and learn to recognize with a whole line of thinkers ranging from Merton to Habermas to Kitcher that rationality is something fully embedded in and dependent on social, political, and institutional settings, but not meaningless for that reason as a normative guide to practice. One more. We also need to lose the habit of equating the content of science with theories or ideas. Scientific content is embodied in all epistemic aspects of scientific practices, including not only ideas and theories, but experiments, facts, models, arguments, know-how, inventions, technological applications, materials, and instruments. The dichotomy between theory and practice is generally spurious, as shown most clearly by some excellent works on theoretical practice, practice of theory, right? for example, by Andy Warwick and more recently David Kaiser. Now, I think the greatest harm comes from the fact that all these false dichotomies tend to get lined up together, as I've shown on that slide reinforcing each other and creating a misleading binary view of our business. And all of those dichotomies have also been mapped onto the external-internal distinction. That old thing that we all love to hate now. But I think actually the internal-external distinction can be cogent and useful. Dudley Shapir has a reformulation of the distinction which can be helpful. Shapir takes the internal as what has been internalized in a particular epistemic community. Internal considerations are based on a body of belief that have come to be accepted beyond any specific and practical doubt due to the success and coherence of scientific inquiries made on their basis. Such belief, Shapir says, constitute the basis on which science can alter its domains and build further hypotheses, methods, rules of thinking, and goals. Now, I would broaden this notion uh, to incorporate other aspects of scientific practice rather than just beliefs. But that's uh, not so much relevant now. The most important thing for now is Shapir's insight that the internal and external distinction is forged in the very process of investigation of nature not laid down in some edict from heaven or philosophy which determines what counts as scientific and what does not. So if we take the distinction in this way and free it from the misassociation with the forest dichotomies discussed earlier, it can help us distinguish different kinds of questions in history of science that demand different modes of inquiry. So that revised sense of internal and external is what I will mean when I use those terms in the rest of the lecture. <clears throat> so, all that was preparing the ground, and here are finally my points. History of science has some very important functions that cannot be served unless we engage with the content of science and do so with independent critical judgment. I emphasize that this is not to say that it doesn't have other kinds of valuable functions, only that the functions I'm going to talk about today tend to be insufficiently emphasized. Engaging with the content of science while exercising our own judgment is what I really mean by putting science back in the history of science. In order to realize the full potential of history of science, we historians need to be people of scientific discernment. As an instructive comparison, take Peter Winch's view on the history of art. He says, a historian of art must have some aesthetic sense if he or she is un to understand the problems confronting the artist of his period. And without this, he will have left out, his, out of his account precisely what would have made it a history of art, as opposed to a rather puzzling external account of certain motions which certain people have been perceived to go through. There is every reason, I think, to apply this insight history of science as well. 
Now, among today's historians of science, the conventional wisdom is that our business is to describe past scientific knowledge and perhaps explain how it came to be the way it was. But we do not and should not pass judgment on it. This is almost a reflex we now have. Many a student's wrist is slapped every day in history of science classrooms for violating this taboo. I think this is an incoherent, misleading, untenable, and harmful attitude, which we need to abandon before we can talk seriously about the functions of this field of science. And I think we've ended up with it as a result of a misguided overreaction against traditional British history of science. It is often assumed that the sins of Whiggism in judging past science according to the criteria of present science can only be avoided by suspending judgment altogether, either through the kind of epistemic neutrality advocated in Kuhnian internal history or in the impartiality principle of the strong program, for example. But this is an extreme response. As Nick Jardine says, all too often recent historians of science have abandoned common sense in their flight from presentism. So what can we do? Well, to fight Whiggism, which I think we should most of the time, we only need to make sure that our view of past science is not dictated by current scientific orthodoxy. It is not necessary to abandon all judgment. And neutrality, in fact, is a judgmental stance, only disguised as non-judgment. I mean, in the realm of politics, would anybody consider that it was not a political act for Switzerland or Austria to declare itself a neutral nation? In the historiography of science, the refusal to endorse the more modern-sounding view can actually be a powerful tool of pluralism or even of dissent. Personally, I remember feeling that forceful, liberating effect of neutrality when I first read Kuhn's account of the Copernican Revolution with his sympathetic description of how the Ptolemaic geocentric system of astronomy worked and made sense. The claim of neutrality, I think, has worked as a useful defensive shield for those historians of science whose dedication to their chosen topics in fact, so the strong critical judgment, namely that there was value in the dusty old systems of science that scientists themselves had discarded as outdated and worthless. Why else would you want to spend all your life deciphering Galileo's true meaning or anything else you want to do? But if you have science, as an academic discipline, I think is now strong enough to throw off that shield of feigned neutrality against the shallow and harsh judgment of scientists. What we need instead, as Paul Foreman put it, is a declaration of independence. We can have a self-confident conception of historiography as practiced by free and responsible agents. We should start by admitting our own inevitable rootedness in present society and science. But the question is, which part and which version of the present do we choose to take as our platform? I find inspiration in Foreman's exhortation to historians of science to embrace the obligation to decide for ourselves what is the good of science, and by our historical research and writing, to advance that good. Foreman lamented the extraordinary intellectual subservience accepted by historians of science in comparison to the situation in history of philosophy, literature, visual art, and music, where the historian also functions as a critic exercising independent judgment. And it is important not to mistake this as an anti-science stance. That would be like saying that a movie critic is against movies. Now, finally, let me present you with a list. A list of those functions of history of science that require engagement with scientific content, with independent judgment. 
this essentially is my argument. And really the point is that this is a rather long list. By functions here, I mean both the inherent aims of the business, roughly the first four items of my list, and the applications of the business for other aims, the last three. In talking about the last three, I'm taking seriously John Heinborn's core for applied history of science. So first, there's a name of history of science that maybe all of us can agree on. To make sense of scientific knowledge as a dynamic entity that develops over time through contingencies. This saying is so obvious to historians today that it may not even seem worth stating, but we must not take it for granted. Out there in the wider world, the enlightened common sense still says that scientific knowledge advances inexorably towards the truth. Many scientists, philosophers, journalists, and others continue to expound the inevitability of scientific progress and the absoluteness of scientific truth once found. As Robert Butterfield said concerning political history, we must teach history precisely because so much bad history exists in the world already. The notion of the contingency of scientific knowledge requires continual defense and reassessment based on epistemic judgments concerning a growing body of concrete historical episodes. For myself, a formative experience in this regard was making my own detailed study of the chemical revolution, the experiments and arguments that form the substance of it. And that's summarized in the first chapter of my recent book, and that is the structure of chapter one. What happened with this work? Despite my honest efforts, I could not convince myself that there were good enough reasons in the late 18th century to abandon the phlogiston. <coughs> and I mean good reasons according to the standards of judgment that were shared among chemists at the time. Nor could I see any deterministic external causes which could explain Lavoisier's victory. Therefore, I had to face up to the judgment that formed within myself that the majority of scientists in the late 18th century made a misjudgment concerning phlogiston. Whether they were influenced by Lavoisier's rhetoric, or by a metaphysical bias, or by a sheer bandwagon effect, or anything else. Recognizing this complex con contingency of a key event in the history of science, had very significant effects on my thinking and on my practice as a historian. Next on my list of the functions of history of science is the study of scientific methodology and its evolution. Historians these days tend to avoid even mentioning the scientific method. It helps if you take the the out, well, not in time. This is unfortunate. Though understandable as an allergic reaction to some very bad philosophy of science. With my philosopher hat on, I can assure you that many of us in the philosophy of science have been working very hard to move beyond the kind of philosophizing that puts historians off. I assure you, it is safe to work with us again. <laughs> and that philosophical work can connect very well with discussions of styles and ways of knowing, such as uh, advanced by John Hickston here in Manchester. It is important that we acquire sensible ideas about the methods of science, partly, again, because there are such bad ideas about them already out there, and they harm science education and science policy. And if we want to learn about scientific methods, there is really no alternative except to turn to history. Critical judgment is again essential here because we cannot discern good and valid methods without making judgments about which instances of scientific work good and which not. Now I want to come to two functions of history of science that I think are very unjustly neglected in usual historiographical discussions. Regarding the third one, who used to talk about getting into someone's head? Aside from being an injunction for historians to lose modern prejudices, as you 
jump into John Dorton's head. I believe that this idiom expressed the sheer joy of understanding how someone from the distant past saw the war. Heilbronn has been explicit in stating that a historian of science should be a connoisseur. The renunciation of the pleasures of a connoisseur would be a huge loss to our culture. What we have here is the business of appreciating past scientific knowledge in itself for its own sake. In the modern work that I have called complementary science, the recovery of forgotten knowledge is a major aim of historical work and this covers facts as well as ideas. There's no time to go through this in detail, so I'll show you just one brief glimpse at what sort of thing one could learn from long forgotten past science. So when I was doing my research on thermometry, which was in the previous book, I repeatedly came across 18th and 19th century texts reporting that the temperature of boiling water depended on a whole variety of circumstances. So they claimed that even pure water, under standard pressure, standard atmospheric pressure, would boil very differently, depending on how exactly it was boiled. And that is all true. What you see in the video that's about to play is my replication of a phenomenon reported by Jean-André de Luc of Geneva in 1772, though, as you see, clearly not his uh, exact experimental arrangement. <laughs> What happens, the question is, what happens if one boils water with a low temperature heat source, such as the hot plate there, which is made possible by cutting down the surface area of water through which heat loss happens. So long, thin necked flask will do that job. As you see, as the temperature on the, of the water approaches 100 degrees, it starts to boil in a normal way. As boiling continues, however, the temperature continues to rise, while the bubbles get bigger but less frequent. They also come more irregularly, often in bursts. The temperature goes over 100 degrees, easily reaching 101, 102, again under normal pressure, while the boiling is reasonably steady. With continued heating, the bubbles can become even less frequent, while temperature creeps up further. At this stage, we can observe what the look called puffing, with long, quiet periods punctuated by very large bubbles. Sometimes the puffs are explosive, throwing water out of the flask. It's about to do that. The trial shown in this video produced a temperature of 104 degrees during puffing. This is nothing like boiling as we know it, but entirely consistent with what the look reported in 1772, recovery. Function four, in addition to recovering <coughs> neglected knowledge from the past, historical research can extend scientific knowledge by stimulating new thinking. Perhaps the most illustrious example of this is in the work of Martin Rudwick, who took methodological ideas from Cuvier to help him in, I quote, reconstructing the mode of life of extinct invertebrates, or brachiopods, which was successful despite hostility and opposition from paleontologists who could not think that anything good could come from someone pre-Darwin, especially an anti-evolutionist whom I was using for evolutionary purposes. Thank you, Martin. In my own work, I have noted how recovered scientific knowledge can be extended, as I will illustrate again with a very brief example. This comes from my current research on the early history of electrochemistry. I was very interested to learn that Volta used salt water rather than acid or anything else more exciting as the electrolyte in his battery, the wet stuff. This very mundane piece of recovery stimulated my modern curiosity about the electrochemical properties of salt and ACL solution and led to some interesting new experiments. For example, while attempting to learn more about the mechanism of electrical conduction in the solution 
I discovered that a gold anode will dissolve in salt water on applying a voltage roughly between 2 and 3 volts, as seen here. A little later, you have a slightly clearer view of the yellow stuff just hissing down from the gold wire. And much over 3 volts, it stops. Chlorine gas comes out instead. This phenomenon has surprised every chemist that I've shown it to, and its investigation may yield some interesting new chemical knowledge. Or it may not, we will have to see. Now, once all four of these aims are met, there's much else we can do with history of science, so the applied functions now. Many people have advocated the introduction of serious history of science in science education. This is an idea easily advocated and seldom practiced. Despite the successes of some initiatives, going all the way back to Project Physics by Gerald Morton and colleagues at least. This is a function of history of science that we cannot afford to neglect. By not connecting better with science education, we historians of science are abandoning millions and millions of science students at all levels, being tortured with bad history. And we must also remember that most science teaching is directed to those who will not become professional scientists. Therefore, it is a civic mission for us to consider how the teaching of science can be improved for the education of better citizens. And it should go without saying that such educational functions of history cannot be served without a close critical attention to the content of past science. History of science can also facilitate the bridging of the gap between different ways of scholarly thinking, so memorably caricatured by C.P. Snow in his description of the two cultures, which still has a strong resonance despite the withering criticism by David Edgerton and others. Situating science in its cultural context surely helps, but that needs to be complemented by a content side strategy. A true cultural understanding of the world of science requires an empathetic appreciation of its content. The history of science provides the most suitable material, obviously, for such scientific education of non-scientists. In the other direction, what better humanist education of scientific people could there be than a convincing demonstration that the very content of long-established scientific knowledge embodies contingent human actions and strivings. Finally, it is an important function of science studies in general to challenge the authority of scientists when and where they deserve it. Scientists, like all other figures of authority, need external scrutiny by well-informed people with good judgment. But questioning scientific orthodoxy is not something one does lightly and judgment must always be made responsibly. This makes it all the more essential that our work should be grounded in a sound understanding of the content and methods of science. We need to get into the heart of the content of the relevant science and command the respect of the scientists that we mean to challenge. For example, witness James Cushing's painstaking technical historical work Showing the contingency involved in the establishment of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Even when the debate is about present science rather than past science, the knowledge of history gives us perspective and judgment, and exactly the kind of judgment that practicing scientists tend to lack. All seven of these functions are important. And they can only be served through detailed attention to scientific content. By neglecting these functions, I think history of science impoverishes itself and diminishes its own significance very unnecessarily. We cannot let methodological fashion or dogmatism limit the potential of our field to benefit and society. There is too much at stake. And it is not impossible to learn the science that we need, even if you don't have scientific training. 
Surely anybody can learn the phlogiston theory much more easily than learning, say, Latin or Chinese, the kind of thing that historians routinely do. Now, I, I, I admit, of course, that there are other functions of history of science that do not revolve around scientific content, but attention to content is not useless or futile even for those who want to concern themselves exclusively with the study of science as a social, cultural, political, economic, or material phenomenon. Even a purely anthropological study would need to be informed by some understanding of the beliefs and practices of the tribe of scientists that we want to study. A real anthropologist studying another society's religious practices, for example, would never suggest that the doctrinal content of the religion and the aspects of the rituals tied to the doctrines were irrelevant to the study of religion. In this way, interestingly, the content of science becomes a crucial context for the study of context. I say content is the new context. More seriously, I call it the knowledge context. When we are learning about science as a socio-cultural activity, it is surely relevant. Relevant contextual information that the chief aim of that activity on the part of the actors themselves is the acquisition of knowledge and the notion that they consider themselves to be learning such and such specific things. Now I come to the last part of my presentation. Having stressed the distinctive functions of history of science, let me now briefly offer a perspective from, say, the opposite angle. So, let's take it that history of science is, after all, a kind of history. So let's first think about how to do good history in general, and apply that thinking to history of science in particular. And we cannot rationally discuss how to do good history without considering why we bother doing it. Surveying the writings of various historians, I have identified five general reasons for doing history. Each of these reasons dictates that when the object of our historical study is science, we must engage with its content. So I will come to the same broad conclusion again, starting from general historiographical concerns. So why do we want to do history? First of all, it may be because we want to describe the past, obvious. This may be for the record, or for the sake of having a kind of esoteric knowledge which other people don't have. <laughs> Either way, it should be uncontroversial that, that a full description of the past of science must include a description of the state of scientific knowledge at each stage and location of its development. Just as it seems uncontroversial that the stated theme of this Congress is knowledge at work. I don't know who came up with that, but it's a good thing. <laughs> Going beyond description, we may take the purpose of history to be reaching an understanding of the past. This may be broadly in two different senses. For an empathetic understanding, let's say Ferstein, of past science, which involves seeing the world fully in the actors' categories, it goes without saying that knowing the content of past science is crucial. For a more externalist, explanatory type of understanding, looking not so much for empathy, but for causes and influences, the content of science may not be so central. But content must still constitute an important part of the explanatory or what we want to explain. Description and understanding aside, there is also the persistent impulse to use the past and its knowledge for our purposes. This is risky business, but all we can do is try to do it well, rather than avoid it and let unprofessional or unscrupulous people do it badly. This is a big debate, of course, in political history all the time. I think the same should be happening in history of science. 
there is much debate about what kind of lessons or at least experience can be gained from the past. And it is widely accepted that history is routinely used to give individuals and groups a sense of identity. Applying these thoughts to history of science brings us back to science policy and science education, and also to the place of history of science in the life of practicing scientists. For myself, as mentioned earlier, another important use of history is to improve scientific knowledge itself. It is not difficult to see that the usefulness of history of science would be enhanced, enhanced by a serious engagement with its content. Now, a particular use of history, which I set aside here on the separate heading, is to allow the understanding of the past to liberate us from the past itself. Contingent decisions made in the past shape our present. Identifying those elements of past contingency allows us to see what they may see, see that what may seem like an oppressive necessity or inevitability in our present situation actually was and can be again a matter of human choice. That's rather a psychoanalytic insight. It's perhaps not a mainstream view in general historiography, but it has a very respectable pedigree including Goethe, Deltai, Mahu, and Benedetto Croce, who gave us this, this famous dictum, only historical judgment liberates the spirit from the pressure of the past. Our scientific life, too, can benefit from understanding the apparent necessity of today as a consequence of past contingency. And for this, the historian must delve into the details of the arguments that took place among past scientists. Finally, there is a particular kind of understanding of the past that I want to set aside as a separate purpose. An exuberant expression of this purpose comes from Armi Marhu, who says, I will assign to history as one of its essential functions the enrichment of my internal universe by recapturing cultural valuables salvaged from the past. They exist in the bosom of lost societies or civilizations, but to the extent that we are capable of grasping and understanding them, they again come to life in us. In a sense, they acquire a new reality and a second historical existence in the womb of the historian's thought and in the contemporary culture to which he, he reintroduces them. And I apply this insight to science. More briefly, here is Bartolt Niebuhr, who says, He who calls what has vanished back into be again into being enjoys a bliss like that of creating. Thank you, Jim for, for this quotation. There's no reason why these insights should not apply in the history of science, as I discussed earlier, in terms of recovery and connoisseurship. I would like to conclude on a pluralistic note. In this lecture, I have pushed strongly a particular vision of the functions of the discipline of history of science, and try to argue that critical attention to the content of science is required for serving those functions. But there are many diverse modes of study included in my vision, and I also certainly do not mean to suggest that those modes of study falling outside my vision are invalid or inferior. There are no enemies here, except for those who are in the habit of making enemies, declaring that anything that doesn't fit into their own narrow-minded view of good scholarship is not history or not real history of science, and therefore not worth pursuing. The general plea I would like to make is for more conscious deliberation and debate about why we do history of science and of technology and of medicine and how we should do it in order to achieve whatever aims we might have. Such considerations will inevitably have to examine the relationship between history of science and science itself. And I think a much more vigorous debate on this issue is crucial to the health of our discipline. My own view on 
that crucial relationship is that history of science should approach science with understanding and respect, even with love, but also with critical confidence and independence. Thank you very much.